Recently, John Travolta was here talking about his new film, Civil Action. Tonight, we are joined by two of his colleagues, the man who wrote the original book and the screenwriter-director. Jonathan Hart spent eight years working on his first book, A Civil Action, before finally getting it published in 1995. He went on to dominate bestseller lists for months and win the National Book Critics Circle Award. Now it has been made into a film by screenwriter and director Steve Zalian. It opens nationwide this Friday. It is already earning critical praise. Joining me now for a conversation about this film, writer-director Steven Zalian, the author of the book Jonathan Haar, and the film star John Travolta, who plays attorney Jan Schlickman. Welcome, one and all. Thank you for staying. It's a pleasure to have you here. Let me begin with the author. Um, when you, how long did you spend chronicling this story? The whole thing took me eight and a half years. And, uh, and my, oh. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, my contract with Random House called for me to be done in two and a half years. Yeah. And I got a modest sum of money that I thought, you know, would enable me to, 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 to get it done in two and a half years. And uh, I got in, you know, far deeper than I ever thought I would. It was far more complicated than I anticipated. And um, it was, uh, you know, there's a real parallel with the, the lawyer I wrote about, Jan Schlickman, who devoted his eight, eight and a half, ten years virtually to the case. And, you devoted much time to writing the book as he devoted to the case. Exactly, yeah. yeah. What brought you to the story? Very circuitous. It was a big story in the Boston area because of the, the trial was about to happen. This community had been affected. There was uh, lots of deaths from leukemia. So I was sort of aware of it, but in a kind of peripheral way. Um, what really brought me to it was a very good friend of mine, uh, another writer, Tracy Kidder, who's uh, sure. won a Pulitzer Prize, yeah. wrote Soul of a New Machine. Um, he's a neighbor of mine out where I live in Northampton, and he's a very good friend, and he's the one who suggested to me that I might be interested in it. And what happened was I then went in to meet um, Jan Schlickman. And uh, what I wanted was complete access. I wasn't going to write it like your typical journalist. I wasn't just going to sit in the courtroom and follow, follow what happened in the courtroom. I wanted to be there behind the scenes. And, uh, and Jan talked to the families, his clients, the eight Woburn families, and, and they agreed to it. And, um, and that's really what, what got me into it. I mean, I wouldn't have done it had it not been that access that Jan Schlickman granted me. And what you see on the screen now, I mean, you can never do full justice to a book in a movie, ever. Some will say things like an English patient, it was different and maybe even better. Michael and Dacha was here uh, with the director and, and almost said that. Can you? <laughs> I said no, him will say that. Too. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yeah. but, but how do you feel about this movie, seeing your book up on the big screen? I, was, um, I saw it in its completed form uh, in early December. And uh, I, was, I was kind of conscious. I was conscious of the people around me. I was conscious of Steve being there. I was conscious of Robert Duvall was seeing it for the first time. And I was very conscious of everybody around me. And I was afraid I really wasn't going to be able to pay attention to the movie. But two minutes into it, I just got sucked into the movie. I just uh, became riveted by it. And it was not... Um, I didn't engage in any sort of comparison of the movie between the book. It was its own story, and which is what I knew would happen all along. I mean, I tried not to. I did not, in fact, emphatically, did not step on Steve's toes, mainly because he wouldn't let his toes anywhere near me. He didn't want me to step <laughs> what, on him. Did you but, have any input into what went on the screen? I, I never put uh, word to page concerning this movie. I mean, Steve wrote the screenplay. I met Steve early on, just when he'd signed on to write the screenplay. Um, I was in Los Angeles. We were actually going to go to the OJ trial together that day. We tried. And uh, we tried. And uh, I just, uh, I felt an immediate affinity with him. I mean, we just kind of uh, hit it off, at least from my perspective, we did. Um, I trusted him immediately. I also knew what he'd done. I mean, Schindler's List and Searching for Bobby Fischer, Awakenings, I mean, all movies that I really liked. So I, I just... Uh, you know, I had complete faith in him. Not bad movies. Why Travolta? <laughs> <laughs> That's why. You know, I mean, he, he embodied the character, uh, as far as I'm concerned. I mean, I think that uh, Jan Schlickman was, um, not having met him at the time, but my impression of who he was, was somebody who uh, 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 people loved, people would follow, people had, um, had a lot of charisma. Um, and uh, was a great showman. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I look at John and I see all those things. Yeah. And I've seen that in, in the films that he's done. Um, on the other hand, it, it is a film that uh, 
uh, character goes to places that I had not seen John go to uh, like in, in films. Um, kind of like total despair, you know. I mean, total despair and 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 in real introspective kinds uh, kind of place. Um, that I thought he would be good at and might enjoy doing. Now, what happens here, John, when you've got a director? Whose relationship he sees a book that he loves and he's, you're the actor he wants. Uh, what's the collaboration here between him, who's taking from him, and you take from both? Well, for me, it, it, I'm sure it's subjective. You know, each uh, actor, director, writer has uh, their own version of what happens. But for me, what happens is I, I have to have first the feeling that he had about my doing, the enthusiasm. Anything less than that. It, it, you're just a sunk ship. In other words, <laughs> if the director doesn't convince you that I so firmly believe that I don't have the movie I want unless you're here, yes. then the you collaboration don't want any part. has not started. You see, you need the collaboration to start, and that starts it. Especially if you can see what um, the director sees in in uh, in your possibly doing it. Do you know? And, uh, and something happened too. I mean, I. I hope you remember it. I certainly remember it. When you came over to my house when we first met, I mean, I, I had based, you know, my, my opinion that he could do this part uh, it was based on having seen him in the films that he had done. Um, a lot of times when you get together and you meet, it's really kind of, uh, you know, just sort of a perfunctory meeting, you know, something you have to go through. Um, for me, uh, it was, it was um, I saw even more of Jan when I met him when he came to my house. and and who he was as a person, um, and that that charm that he has is something that is innate to him and isn't something that is just on the screen. It is, it is part of who he is. Of course, there was moments that worried me because I thought, well, is he only just saying the good parts or does he also see something else that he sees in me? <laughs> ah, ah. <laughs> you see, so there were moments of... Probably uh, yes, huh? Well, don't put him on the spot, and I don't want to hear it. But uh, <laughs> yeah, no, no, come on. I mean, that's come on. we're adults here. Well, that's no. What it, what it is is okay. The things, interestingly enough, the things that I saw were pertinent to to performing this correctly, which is an ability to distance oneself emotionally from people, to to be uh, arrogant, to be um, detached, to be uh, like a, a bull in a china shop. All those things that I felt. I hadn't portrayed in a movie yet, other than playing a psychotic and, you know, a face off or a broken mm -hmm. arrow or something. Mm -hmm. So I felt that, that in a genuine kind of realistic character versus a fantasy character, those are things that I had to achieve. How do I make a guy watchable that has to kind of be this way? And the key, which Steve and I discussed and agreed upon, was making the character not aware that he was those things. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. You see, and that, that really was the key, because then it, it's, it's absolutely... Uh, not guileless, but it, it has a, a version that's more watchable. I think it is guileless and, and watchable. I mean, <laughs> yeah. both of those things. It's, uh, I mean, somebody who is aware that he's, you know, uh, an unpleasant or uncaring or unfeeling person is not going to be much fun to watch. Right. And, uh, or is not going to be that way for very long yeah. if he's aware of it. Right. Yeah. Did Jan have any involvement in this? Did you go see him, John? Did you talk to him because he's so central to this film? I, I didn't. I mean, I, I based uh, my character in the script, certainly for the first couple of drafts, completely on Jonathan's book and Jonathan's descriptions of Jan, Jonathan's interpretation of who Jan was. Um, I met Jan finally, just before we started shooting, when he walked into my office. I was stunned when he finally walked in. Because? Um, it was okay at that point because the script, I, I, had, I, I had imagined the way that I needed him to be in, in, in this story. So it wasn't a bad thing when he finally walked in the room. But I did not want to, to see the face and hear the voice any more than I think John would, uh, because I felt I'd be doing an imitation of who he is rather than a living, breathing character that came you know, out of you know, m m my impression of who he is. Also, uh, Steve discouraged my yeah. meeting Jan. For the same reason. For the same yeah. reason. But also, if you want, there was not a lot for me to learn from Jan that hadn't already been written, yeah. in theory, because I was watching this, the let's say, the evolved Jan. I wanted more of the, the things I needed to make him float, which mm -hmm. is uh, 
the things we've just discussed. Mm -hmm. And those weren't things I was going to necessarily get in a, in, a, in, a, in a meeting that someone was possibly excited to meet me because of who I'm, I may represent to him, you know. Yeah. So I, I wasn't sure I could gain anything from that other than a nice exchange and appreciation that he, that he did this. And that, that, uh, that he had uh, a situation where a writer as talented as Jonathan could write about a case as important as this case uh, was. You're also going to meet a, a, a Jan ten years later. I mean, yes. a, a, yeah. an enlightening it, it, Jan. That's an interesting point. That's no. a very good point. You know, you're, you're going to see them at the end of his this well, experience. Well, that's what I meant by the yeah. evolved. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Which has nothing to do yeah. with the character that. Right. Uh, in the, the things movie. I needed were more that I could gather from my memory of working with lawyers for 23 years. I, I got much more of my so-called uh, attributes from those guys. This yeah. story is about two things. One, I mean, many things, but these two: that there are people. Uh, in this town in Massachusetts who have seen their children die from leukemia and therefore desperately want some questions answered. Uh, that's part of it. The other part is the story of how this lawyer and this law firm come to do battle on their behalf to lose or, or win as this story evolves. Take a look at this initial meeting between the attorney, played by John, the family, played by different actors, including uh, the actress Kathleen Quinlan, who plays Anne Anderson. Roll tape. Who is going to apologize to you and pay me? There has to be a defendant and one with very deep pockets. This is not an inexpensive case to try. One directoral question. Of course I can. <laughs> the wide shot that you had there, what was that about? Was that, in a sense, for any particular reason, in From the Kitchen? That shot um, uh, was the widest place in the room. That was as far back as we could get. And what I, that's one reason. The other uh, uh, reason was, I don't know if you can tell, or I don't even know if you notice it, but on the counter in the kitchen is all of the food that they've brought and that they hope to eat in celebration for oh, once I he takes the that. case. And so it's yeah. all these full you know, sort of homemade uh, pies and chips, you know, plate of chips and that sort of thing. Um, and that's why we're in the kitchen. You said to me uh, that, that they, my guys in the control room picked out just the right scene to so. to ignite the point, to, to, to yeah. illustrate the point we were just mm -hmm. talking about. Mm -hmm. Right. Absolutely. This is uh, my favorite scene as far as, uh, let's say, uh, his essence and uh, his attributes are, are expressed. I think it's. Uh, I think this is where you see the, the coldness and the distance, the insensitivity, and the um, the indifference that he has for, for and, and and his greediness. I mean, it's out out there. We have to find deep pockets, and you don't have it. I mean, it's so. I mean, this is where he shines as a black male lawyer to me. Do you know? What I mean, it, it's. Uh, I don't know. It's just one of my favorite. Right. Uh, Take uh, that and go to this scene. I want to see. This is a scene in which we now in, are in trial, and we now know that this trial has two stages to it. One is you got to prove that, in fact, um, the river was contaminated. And secondly, you got to prove that the contamination, in fact, caused the death of these children. Those two issues have been separated by the judge. Am I saying this reasonably correct? Mm -hmm. uh, and all of a sudden, the judge is making a decision on the first issue, and the lawyer for one of the corporate deep pockets played by Robert Duvall comes over to talk to John. Here it is. Now, that would put things in perspective for you, wouldn't it, as far as truth and justice and, uh, and dead children go? If you want to talk seriously about a settlement offer, let's get the decision makers together and talk seriously. Mm. You looked at me and you said, that is great. It's it's uh, that pause uh, between those two characters kills me, because it, in one second it could solve everything we think he needs it to solve, and and that brave editing pause I think is like primo. I just love it. <laughs> primo. Yeah. Yeah. Did you feel like you were stretching it at all, or was it just just for you was? Primo. I, I, I never did. I mean, I think that when you're writing, whether it's a book or a script, you kind of know when things are 
are going well, and yeah, you also yeah, know when true. they're not. <laughs> yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. and Steven I always Spiel- felt that this one was what it should be. It's Steven Spielberg's scene. favorite moment in the movie. Yeah, he he talked to you about it, and he talked to me about it, but he just loved that this moment. Yeah, yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. love that moment. Duvall, tell me about him in this performance. I, he's, I mean, he's great in it. Uh, he's I, a great actor, we know that. He is a great actor. I, I don't think that I actually m- met Robert Duvall, the, the, the actual man, until the movie was over. Um, when I first saw him, uh, I mean, I met him briefly before we started, but once he put on the clothes, and I was there when he was trying on the clothes uh, for a wardrobe fitting, when he came out, he moved different than than Robert does. He talked different than he normally does. He was much more restrained than he, than he is in real life. And he was like that uh, the entire time on the set. Very quiet um, and uh, very much the character. Uh, then, then after it was all over, uh, I saw him, and he, you know, he's very <laughs> gregarious. Yeah, guy, but did, did, you know? Was there a real life actor that was like this, or did he just take a character and give it his own? Yeah, sort? I don't think he didn't spend any time with the real life character Jerry Fasher. He took it and gave it his own thing. But, but the wonderful coincidence of casting is that I think that uh, Robert Duvall was absolutely perfect to play Jerry Fasher. I mean, he has not only the size and the kind of mannerisms. And, not the precise mannerisms, but close enough. And uh, um, I mean, I, I can see it right away. Whereas John, you know, is not the physical type of Jan Schlickman, who's tall and very and very thin. Um, but the psychological type is what you is what you did so well about Jan, the selfish rogue, you know, who underneath it all, you find that he has a heart, and that's what that's what. What well, we raised in our conversation really about well. the idea to do well and do good is somewhere deep inside of him. Well, mm-hmm. Schlickman always said he wanted to get rich and famous by doing good. That was his, you know, line, and that's what he tried to do in this case. Now, you take the back to acting. There, there is this whole notion. Of, of the character of the Duval plays, mm-hmm. tosses a baseball, he goes to and retreats to a portion of the library of the law firm mm-hmm. and brings his little radio and his lunch and it's his moment of quietude there. Does that come out of the script, out of your book, out of the script? Comes out of real life. Real I mean, life. He really That's had a ball that he tossed against the wall. And oh, he so had all a... of that was given to him in a screenplay. I, well, well, in real life, in the book, and then in the screenplay, yeah. and then yeah. on the screen. I mean, it's 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 well, it's the kind of the, most two, of those three, details are 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 his actual uh, yeah. habits. Yeah. Um, the trick with that is to not make it so eccentric that it gets silly. You know, and and sometimes if you add up all of those kinds of mannerisms in the wrong hands, with the wrong actor, it can get silly. You know, yeah, one, I read one story about your technique as a director, which spoke of some as- exasperation by Duvall and you in terms of the number of takes you had to take. <laughs> Is that true? Ah, uh, Steve. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, well, we did we did take several takes in the scene, and. Uh, but uh, it got to the point where we, we finally understood what Steve was going for. And when, I don't know if it was probably a different moment than that I had than Robert Duvall had, right. but I think when we both got it, we went along on his uh, ship yeah. and realized that Steve had quite a distinct vision and that it was worth doing as many takes as, as, as he needed and that we, we, we realized there was a vision here that was worthy of yeah. So you might not know what he's quite after and how it fits into the larger scheme, either because he hasn't expressed it well or right. because you haven't received it or whatever. But you're saying, as an actor... There's a, a moment where you know your director is at the helm and taking very good care of you. And that's good. It's great. You want that moment. You really want that moment. But sometimes it could take a week, it could take a month, it could take whatever. And, uh, and as Robert Duvall said, that Steve is tasty. <laughs> and I like that term because I think that's true. Steve is uh, is has great taste in acting moments and in choice of uh, style of filming too. And I think that's what we both realized together. And once we 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 did that, we were we were home free. Yeah. I mean, the, the, I guess in in a way, the actors might be at a slight disadvantage in that I've, and maybe it's true with all writer directors. I don't know that I've written the script. I've seen it once, I've heard it, not once, several times in the writing of it, 
And so if there's something that I heard, you know, in, in the dialogue or in just the expression of a scene, um, it's sometimes easier just to keep shooting until I hear it again rather than trying to describe it in words to them, you know. So we'll just keep doing it a few times and, until... When you hear it, you'll know it. When you hear it, you'll when know it. When I hear it, I'll, I'll recognize it because yeah. I've heard it before. All right. This is the last scene we're going to show you. This is an interesting point because, it, again, weaves the themes that we've been talking about in the hour conversation I did earlier with John and in this conversation uh, where they're debating among the lawyers about whether the case is even about money anymore. Here it is. Listen to yourself. Well, I, for one, am sick of listening to you. Lost enough because of you. You wouldn't have anything to lose if it wasn't for me. Everything you have, I got for you. My last question, uh, Jonathan. What do you hope that law students, film goers, book readers get out of this? That's, um, that's a difficult question. My first aim in writing the book was, I had a couple of different aims, but the first aim is to entertain people. You want to get them into the book, you want them to read it, and then you hope to inform them. But I was not the author pontificating about what it all meant throughout it. I mean, my idea was that um, the author never stepped forward in the book, and my idea was that um, people would come away from it with what they came away from it with. Um, the book is being used in a lot of law schools now, something that flatters me hugely. Um, it's being used to teach civil procedure. I'm not a lawyer, um, never took a civil procedure class. I'm very flattered by that. I had no expectation that that would ever happen. Um, you know, I hope that um, there is something else, of course, and I think Steve shares this and John, too, that, uh, that people also come away with... Uh, with a realization of how important it is that we treat our environment well, that you cannot uh, create a sink where you live, that you know, clean air and clean water is vital for us to exist as a society. And I hope that the movie conveys that message as well. And finally, it's also about entertainment, telling a sure. good story. Telling a good story is first and foremost. Thank you, Steve. Congratulations. Thank you, Thank Thank you very much. Yeah. My friend, as always, great <laughs> to see you. Good to see you. And we'll be right back. Stay with us.